guest here today at Knowing Neurons is Dr. Kelsey Martin, our distinguished lecturer. I'm Jillian Shaw, and we're going to be conducting this interview. I'm Kate Bellhaber. So I guess we wanted to start with what your lab was doing, and can you just tell us the main questions of the lab? Sure. So we're interested in how experience changes the brain during learning and memory, and we think about it very much as cell biologists, and we're especially interested in how experience produces long-lasting changes that underlie long-term memory. And it turns out that to have a long-term memory, you need to have new gene expression. And as cell biologists, we think about how that works in the context of a neuron, where you have this very polarized cell that elaborates really long processes and makes thousands of synapses. And so the fact that you need new gene expression raises questions about how do you get a signal from a distal synapse all the way back to the nucleus to regulate transcription, but it also raises questions about how can you have changes that happen in individual synapses, but that require gene expression. So how do you spatially regulate gene expression in the neuron? So I'm really interested in how you went from working in infectious diseases to doing yeah. a postdoc with Dr. Eric Kendell. Um, yeah. So I was wondering if you could maybe talk about how that transition came about and also what you worked yeah. on. You know, it's funny because it isn't that different. So when I was at, um, in my PhD, I worked on influenza virus, and it was in a cell biology lab. My thesis research focused on how the influenza ribonuclear particles got into the nucleus during infection and then how they exited the nucleus at the end of infection to then bud out of the plasma membrane to produce infectious particles. So it's really a question of regulated nucleocytoplasmic trafficking, which is what I essentially work on now in the lab. And there were a couple things that happened. One is that it's really a, a question of how you regulate intracellular trafficking and communication between compartments of a cell. And neurons are by far the most interesting cells in that context because there's this huge challenge because of the massive polarity of neurons. So from a cell biological perspective, that became really interesting to me. And actually, when I was thinking about postdocs, one of the postdocs I was thinking about, I remember, was this guy, Vince Racaniello, who works on poliovirus. And it was because that's a great model for looking at how poliovirus particles travel in neurons. You know, so much is known in terms of intracellular trafficking, communication, signal transduction in, in non-neuronal cells, and, and how can I look at that in the context of neurons? So that is one reason. And the other reason is I was an MD-PhD student, so I had, you know, also did medical school and did clinical clerkships, and it was really clear to me in my clinical clerkships that of all of the different clinical specialties, psychiatry was clearly the field that needed the most biology. So you work in other areas and generally you learn about disease and you could understand it in the context of the organ system that was involved. They sort of could understand heart attacks in terms of how the heart works and what all the components of the heart are. And so you could think both about the, the pathophysiology, about the therapy. And then when you got to psychiatry, it was much more of a black box where it was really dramatically clear that we didn't understand the biological basis of psychiatric disorders. And as a result of that, we really had no therapies that were targeted and or really that effective. So, you know, I think that that got me interested in neurobiology that was directly related to psychiatry. So I wasn't initially a scientist. I mean, I studied English literature in college, and I was always interested in human behavior. And so I think neuroscience is just interesting if you're somebody who wants to understand how people experience the world. So I think it's kind of this convergence of those things that made me end up going to uh, Eric Kandel's lab. It's interesting because also Jonah Lair was in Eric Kandel's lab and then went on to write Proust was a neuroscientist. And so oh, it yeah. seems like there's a lot of scientists who are also literary scholars to come. Yeah, yeah. Well, he, Eric Kandel, was a history and literature major okay. and, <laughs> at Harvard, and he clearly writes a lot and has very broad interests, so I think that that's... I think it was a great lab to be a postdoc, and it was a big lab, but there were a lot of postdocs coming from really different backgrounds. People came from more of a molecular cell biology background, like myself, to people who were really electrophysiologists, to people who were doing more behavioral neuroscience, or bacterial geneticists, yeast biologists. So I think that he liked bringing in people who had different expertise to work on the problem of learning and memory. So when you left Eric Kandel's lab, what did you go into being a PI wanting to study? 
when I was a postdoc, I was really interested in this question of how do you get synapse-specific plasticity that requires gene expression. And so I set up a culture system where I could show that if you had a bifurcated sensory neuron that contacted two motor neurons and you stimulated the connections made onto one of the motor neurons, you got changes there and no changes at the other branch, and it required transcription. It actually showed that it required translation of RNAs that were localized to the distal processes. And it also required transcription in the sensory cell. And in aplesia, where the stimulus is serotonin and it doesn't depolarize the cells, it was immediately clear that there had to be some way of transporting a soluble molecule the long distance back to the soma. So I wanted to work on that problem. And then the other problem I wanted to work on really was following up on this requirement for local translation. So I think that what that made clear to me was that the idea that gene expression is regulated locally in neurons was likely to be very important. And so I wanted to try to identify all the RNAs that were localized out at synapses so that I could use those both as tools to understand the biology of how they're transported and how their translation is regulated, but also to try to understand some of the function of local translation and plasticity. So those were the two areas of focus. Wondering if you could give us a sneak preview of what you're going to be talking about at Society for Neuroscience. I'm going to talk a lot about how decentralized gene expression is in neurons and how important the synapse is as the unit for gene expression and how, you know, in an extreme, we for a hundred years followed the ideas of Ramon y Cajal, which of course I believe in of the neuron doctrine, that mm -hmm. there are separate neurons in the brain and that and we rejected what Golgi believed, which was the reticular network theory, that everything was sort of interconnected. And how I think studying gene expression is kind of making that a little bit less clear, that there's less of a focus on the neuron as a unit and more of how much you can decentralize things out to synapses, you know, and potentially start to think about the synapse and its neighborhood, including the glia, and how they contribute to that local environment. I'll focus on very discrete work on both aspects of signaling between the synapses. I'm wondering as well, you touched also that you have an MD, you have yes. this medical training. Um, yeah. How do you see your lab in the grand scheme of translational neuroscience in terms of what you're doing at yeah. Dimension? You know, I'm very much a basic neurobiology. I'm probably one of the least translational neuroscience <laughs> labs I know, but that's because I deeply believe that if we want to solve these problems, we need fundamental biological insights into how the brain works. We do have some work in the lab that is slash translational, but the only reason that we have that is because we work on an RNA binding protein that binds to RNAs that are in the cytoplasm and regulates their metabolism. And it just turns out that that RNA binding protein is a candidate susceptibility gene for autism spectrum disorders. But again, you know, I look at that and I'm pleased about it because we're approaching it really as what can we learn about how RNA binding proteins regulate RNA stability and translation in dendrites and neurons. I'm excited about the idea that human genetic studies are now beginning to identify a lot of candidate susceptibility genes for a variety of psychiatric disorders, and that combining that information with really rigorous reductionist cell and molecular and genetic work in other organisms will help us finally understand a little bit about psychiatric disorders. So I would definitely say on that spectrum, I am at the very fundamental level. The motivation, from my perspective, is to be able to understand and treat human disease. So in the realm of neuroscience, mm -hmm. um, do you have a favorite technique that you think opened up the field in new ways and that was particularly exciting to you? You know, for me, I have to say, from my own lab, the advances in next-generation sequencing have been incredibly powerful for us. They've been powerful because they've allowed us to sort of interrogate gene expression much more easily than we could before. You know, and then again, that whole technology has opened up human genetics in an important way. You know, on the other hand, there are other techniques that are important for us. Like, I have to say, throughout my career, that advances in light microscopy have been incredibly important from confocal microscopy, multi-photon microscopy. We're not using super-resolution microscopy, but I can see ways in which it's going to really benefit us. And so I'm kind of excited about new advances in microscopy for studying where things are and how they move. Okay, well, I wanted to get back to your life as a grad student. What would you say was your favorite memory of grad school? I really had a great 
graduate PhD advisor. His name is Ari Hellenius. He's a really fabulous cell biologist who pioneered using viruses to understand their, how they get into host cells, but in doing so to understand cell trafficking mechanisms. I think I probably spent a year and a half working on a project that went nowhere and, and was probably following up on a complete artifact, but then finally getting onto a project where I actually was getting data and really trying to understand how something worked. So I would say that intellectually that was what was exciting. I think it was really important to me that I had a, a really great relationship with him where I would meet with him probably four hours a week and just go over experiments. So the whole process of feeling that I could think about a problem and figure it out was pretty thrilling, I would say. And that when things didn't work, it didn't mean that I was stuck, that I would be able to take a step back and figure out how to troubleshoot it and or how to just change directions. I just really liked that whole process. I mean, it was also a great lab. It was a joint lab between Ari Hellenius and Ira Melman, and they would have these parties where Ari's finished and he had a sauna, and it would open up the sauna. And they, you know, it was really fun. There was a lot of fun in the lab as well, so I think that that helped. I don't think we've quite gotten to how you went from English and literature yeah. to, to MDPG. lab. Yeah. Yeah. After college, I went to the Peace Corps, so I was in the Democratic Republic of Congo, and I was an English major. I really didn't want to teach English, and I spoke French, and so I kind of made a deal with the Peace Corps that if I went to a French-speaking country, then I wouldn't have to learn the language, and I could work in another. I wanted to do either health or you know agriculture or something like that that was more practical. So I ended up going to the Democratic Republic of Congo and did public health work. I lived in a village that was very isolated, and I guess there was probably about 40% neonatal mortality for kids before the age of five, and a lot of that was from infectious diseases. And so we set up a vaccination program for this rural zone of about 30,000, and it was mostly community organizing. There's no electricity, so you have to you can get vaccines from places like Oxfam and different Doctors Without Borders, but they have to be kept cold, and there's no electricity, so it's working with people who have petrol refrigerators, and it's very much community organizing. But we did that, and then the next year there was no measles, a really clear reduction. And so it was this very powerful illustration to me of what the impact of science is. So my dad is a scientist. University of Washington studies aging, and I think he always wanted me to be a scientist, so he immediately jumped on that and started sending me things <laughs> to read, like the first genes oh, book, which I have somewhere oh, up here, yeah. and biographies of John Enders, who <laughs> developed how you grow polio virus, to Jonas Salk, to develop the vaccine. And, so I came back and I thought, this is really what I want to do. I mean, I love literature, but it's very hard when you go somewhere and there's so much morbidity and mortality and people suffering, and you know a lot about Herman Melville and Wallace Stevens, and I felt sort of empty-handed. So I'd been an undergraduate at Harvard. I went back and got a job part-time, and then part-time took my pre-med classes. And I thought I'd be more interested in public health, and I worked on HIV transmission, and, and this was in the 80s, and there was a big question about whether children who were HIV positive were infectious, and so whether they could go to public schools, whether they could be placed in foster families. And it was really public health, identifying kids, identifying all their targets, but I did this in a molecular virology lab, and people in the lab were interested in how viruses go from replication to latency, and I think that experience just made me realize how exciting science was. So instead of going just to medical school, I ended up doing MD-PhD, and so that's the direction. Kind of long, but it all made sense. So looking back, what do you think had a big influence on becoming successful? Was it luck? Well, I mean, there's always a role for luck, but it certainly isn't just luck. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think it's a combination of going to good places for training, really identifying good questions to do research on. You know, I have to say that everything comes together in a funny way, like even being an English major is helpful to me because I spent my whole undergraduate career writing. I write all the time now. I recognize how useful that is for me when I have to write grants. And I think that there's a part that's just not giving up. I mean, it is a hard career in the sense that everybody gets negative feedback. <laughs> you know, it's competitive, and I think if you're interested enough in what you're doing, you put it into perspective and you just move forward, and you have resilience. So I would say that resilience is probably more important than luck. That overrides any bumps on the road.
So never give up. Is that your advice? Well, I know sometimes people? people should give up if they decide it's not what they want to do. Yeah. You know, I do think it's really important to look into yourself and go, is this really what I want to do? I love this. Or are there other things I love? I don't think everybody loves science. I mean, it was clear to me I did md I didn't do clinical training. I really expected I would do clinical training, but I didn't love being in the hospital. I didn't love patient care despite every expectation I had that that would be something that I would love. But it was clear that me, who I am, it wasn't what floated my boat. I I didn't like it that much. I mean, it's funny now because I feel now that I'm older, I probably would like it much more. So I do think it's not that you don't want to give up. It's that you want to have some self-awareness about what's right for you. right? And, And so that's another thing I would say is important. Now you want to pay attention to feedback you get from other people, but you want to pay equal, if not more, attention to what's coming from inside yourself. I think one thing that brings us back to the bench is mm-hmm. having an exciting discovery or having a hypothesis and being yeah. right about it. Do you remember a time when you had a hypothesis, it may have been controversial, yeah. but that you stuck with it, stuck with your guns, being in the lab, and it was just an exciting day to yeah, yeah, discover yeah. I mean, there are a couple, when I was a graduate student, I realized that the way that these viral RNPs get out of the endosome is that they have a pump that acidifies and the whole RNP falls apart and delivers the nucleic acid into the cell. And I realized that there's a drug that's used to treat flu and that it might work by binding to the pump that is required for acidification. Mm -hmm. And it turned out that that was the case. That was exciting. And in a very different level, when I was a postdoc, I knew I wanted to understand how you get synapse-specific plasticity that requires gene expression, but there wasn't a great system to study it. And I realized because I myself, and it was kind of a lesson about how important it is to do things yourself, so I said I would work on these aplesia cultures, which are very hard to do. It's all microdissection. And... But I realized that while I was doing it, that I was pulling out some cells that had bifurcated axons. And I remember going out and going, oh my goodness, I could set it up so that they're separate and just test it. So that wasn't a discovery, but it was a recognition that there was a system I could use to do that. And then it's fun being a PI. I think people bring findings. There are a lot of findings. There's findings from a postdoc in my lab, Toyin Ching. We're looking at one molecule that goes to the nucleus, and he did just one-dimensional gels and then two-dimensional gels, and we realized that there was just massive regulation of phosphorylation and that that might be a way that you could convert specific patterns of activity to the specific programs of gene expression. And we don't know that yet, but that's pretty exciting. So there have been a lot of things like that. It's not even just knowing that you're right. I think what's more exciting is figuring out that you're going to be able to, you know, that you figure out a way that you can get the answer to the question. That's almost more exciting to me than the answer usually. Who has been most influential? Oh, that's a hard one. I have two different answers to it. Hmm. One of them is, it's kind of like saying that you love Shakespeare. You know, I would say that historically that Ramoni Cajal is, and the reason is because, you know, I'm always struck by the fact that he could look at the data that he got and come up with such amazing ideas. And so I view that as an example of really paying attention to your data. And he sort of exemplifies that for me. You know, I think Larry Zapersky, who's a great neuroscientist here, has been my faculty mentor when I first came here and colleague, and I think he's been influential in the sense of really trying to ask questions in the most rigorous and clearest way. And then I've really enjoyed some of my colleagues in learning and memory here. Like I've worked a lot with Tom Waddell, and I have another colleague who I don't work with, but I just enjoy talking with Dean Buonamano, and I think what characterizes them that it's influential, but more than that, that I admire is that they're PIs, but they work in the lab, that they're really paying attention again to the data. It's not that different from Monica Hall. You know, I think in science, and it's especially in neuroscience because it's so complex, that there's this balance between attending to the experimental data and theorizing in a way that sometimes might not be as grounded in experiments. And I think I have a lot of admiration for people who are able to have an uh, unbiased approach to what the data tells them. Should we move to the lightning round? Okay. Coffee or tea? Coffee. <laughs> no question. <laughs> yeah. Go to comfort food? Ice cream. Hidden talent? Drawing. Favorite place in the whole world and why? Paris. I have a sweet tooth pastry. (laughs) And it's beautiful and I lived there when I was a teenager and I love it. What dead person would you most like to meet or get advice from? 
probably Benjamin Franklin. He invented so many things. <laughs> and what are you currently reading? Well, I just finished Goldfinch, oh. and I just saw that Ian McEwan just has a new book that came out, so I am planning on getting it. And I read The New Yorker. I like reading short stories in The New Yorker. Well, yeah, this has been right. wonderful. Yeah, We've okay. Thank so you many. so much. You're welcome. Good. Looking forward Good. to seeing you live at SFR. Oh, yeah. thanks. Thanks. Well, nice to meet you. Oh, nice.